Have we learned nothing from the coronavirus pandemic? New reporting suggests Chinese laboratories just can't help themselves. According to the Daily Mail, Chinese scientists have reportedly developed a mutant coronavirus strain that attacks the brain and has a 100% kill rate in mice. Worse, they admit there's a risk it could spill over to humans. The virus is a modified version of a strain found in pangolins and was tested on mice, expressing a protein found in humans to test that the disease might impact people. Reportedly, all mice infected with the virus died between seven and eight days after being infected, with symptoms including their eyes turning completely white, rapid weight loss, and fatigue. Researchers additionally found significant viral load in the mice's brains, lungs, noses, eyes, and windpipes. While the potential for a new pandemic could be rising here at home, pandemic prevention measures have done a full 180. Oakland's new COVID policy is allowing even students who test positive for the coronavirus to attend classes. As long as the child is asymptomatic, they can go to school, though they are encouraged to wear a mask. Here to discuss the coronavirus and this potential new mystery disease out of China is Alina Chan, scientific advisor at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard and co-author of Viral, the Search for the Origins of COVID-19. Welcome back to Rising, Alina. Thanks for having me. So, if it is possible to uh, to calm us down, to make our, us less fearful, <laughs> please do so. But I, I know you'll be as honest and blunt as necessary. What is this? Is this study not somehow not as bad as it seems? What's going on? Yes, the, the wording in this study is a bit unfortunate because the pandemic virus, SARS-CoV-2, also causes 100% of humanized mice to, to die. So it, it's not clear based on this new letter, whether or not the, the pangolin virus is, is more concerning than the pandemic virus. But it is yet another example where the public is only learning about risky virus research once it, once it is done, once it's done and published. That's when the public finds out. So if people don't, don't get to find out before the work is done. There is apparently no consultation. And what this means is that if these viruses had not been published, and if they unfortunately leaked from a lab, there would be no way for the public to tell if this was from nature or if it came from a lab, if it had been genetically enhanced. So th this is a real concern for, for the world. What do we know about the safety protocol in effect at the lab where this study was done? As I understand it, a big part of the negligence with respect to COVID-19 was that the kind of equipment being used at the lab was insufficient for the uh, virality of the, um, the virus that was being created. So just to clarify, this this wasn't the Wuhan lab. This was a separate lab in a different part of China. Uh, but typically, these types of viruses had been handled at pretty low biosafety at BSL2. So at this level, there's almost no tracking of lab escapes. So if you had been infected by a virus like SARS-CoV-2 that has only mild symptoms, there's no way you would have caught that and traced it back to the lab and had an, an investigation. So. Uh, this this letter that came out about the pangolin virus actually did not state at what level of biosafety the experiments were done. So it could have been low, it could have been high, there's no way to tell. So I, I think this is yet another reminder that we can't let scientists self-regulate on these sort of experiments, you know, because the, the benefits are unclear of the study, but the risks are real. So the risk could impact billions of people around the world. So a scientist might act on a dangerous idea at inappropriate biosafety and unfortunately billions of people pay the price. So this is yet another reminder that we, we can't just let scientists do whatever they want. And uh, as a reminder for viewers, uh, the difference uh, in the kind of lab safety protocols between the U.S. and some labs in China what has actually been revealed to be uh, a, a, a selling uh, has been a selling point for doing the research. Um, you know, we, we've covered on the show from U.S. Right to Know doing this reporting, showing that some of the one of the grants um, that uh, that Eco Health Alliance was trying to get, you know, specifically was per, was persuading the the oversight officials that it would be done, the research would be done in the U.S. But there's that note where they're saying, but once we get it approved, we can actually do it in China. China, where there's less to worry about in, in terms of oversight. Yes, so the, the jump in cost is, is, is very dramatic. Between a low biosafety level to a higher biosafety level, it can mean millions of dollars of difference, and, and also in personnel training. So for, 
unfortunately, a lot of research programs nowadays are trying to do as much as possible with as little money as possible. So sometimes this means that biosafety costs are cut. So people make estimates of how risky is this work? Can I get away with doing it at a bio, lower biosafety level? And I think that after the pandemic happened, clearly this is no longer acceptable. I think most virologists even would look at this and think, no, we, we can't be cutting costs on biosafety. Yeah, most, most virologists and probably like, <laughs> I, I haven't taken a poll, but I bet 80, 90% of people read a headline like this, uh, that this experiment was done and say, what, we're still doing this kind of thing and, and we're not doing it under the, you know, the, it'd be one thing to do it in Antarctica or on the moon or something, but we're just, we're doing this in the, the same kind of, uh, potentially at least the same kind of circumstances. Yes, that's right. So these labs, no matter what the biosafety level is, they tend to be located right smack in the middle of a city. So if a scientist unfortunately gets exposed to a virus, gets infected, he doesn't even know that they've been infected. They walk out to like the nearest Starbucks or something and boom, like the whole city is infected within like a month or two. Right. So this this could have been what happened in Wuhan in 2019. Unfortunately, is that working with these viruses with unknown pandemic potential, you don't know what symptoms they cause. You don't work with them at the highest biosafety level. And there's no way to track incidents of exposure. And someone just walks out in the middle of the city and boom, you know, all the hospitals, the local market, the train stations that just covered in virus. So I, I think that we we can't keep having coming back to this conversation every time there's a new concerning paper. There should be more proactive action being taken to to increase oversight globally on this type of research. Can you speak to what kind of oversight mechanisms are possible here? The article references Chinese scientists. Are they Chinese scientists under the auspices of the Chinese government? Are they American affiliated scientists in a lab uh, the way we had with the last pandemic? And what are the implications with respect to oversight if it's one or the other? So currently, I think that the norm is that each institute decides for themselves really what, what, is, what is appropriate or not. And they also self-govern their own biosafety levels. So there, there's some responsibility to tell the funders, so people who give them money to do this work, what the safety level is. But at the end of the day, there's no mechanism to enforce, like handing over all your lab records and biosafety incident records should an accident happen. So I would say that, unfortunately, it, it is kind of like the Wild West. So this is what some of the top research funding agency leaders in the UK and US said that it, it is like the Wild West. You don't know what's happening. You don't know what biosafety level at which this work is happening. You only find out later when there might have been a potential mishap. Hmm. Lena Chan, thank you so much for joining us. I remain very fearful, but we appreciate your expertise. Thank you.